excited to be here. Um, so I'm originally from Australia, and you guys are going to be like, what? What's he doing at a hockey conference? <laughs> um, but I, I moved to America eight years ago to study at Stanford University and met a Canadian girl, a real Canadian girl, as Stomp and Con Con Tom Connors would say. She put me onto hockey, and my natural love of statistics did the rest. And uh, now I'm contracting for the Sharks, and this is some of the research I've been doing. And the previous talk was actually a really good lead into this because plus minus is very much the theme of this research. Um, you've seen in the, in the previous talk that you can make plus minus better by doing a simple regression analysis to cater for um, teammates' effects and stuff like that. But what if you go even deeper and use the shifts of e use every single shift, even the ones where no goals were scored, to further improve the information on players in terms of whether they're outscoring their opponents and whether they're outscoring opponents that might have been better than them before. So approaching the world of hockey statistics as first confronted with a few traditional stats, um, you can count points but that's really only going to give you offensive information. Um, plus minus is going to tell you two-way play, which is what you really want. You, you want to outscore your opponents, not just score a lot of goals. Um, but obviously, the, the plus minus stats are, are relatively flawed. Um, there is significant bias, and the data set is relatively small. In terms of the advanced stats, there's a lot of people working on shots, Corsi stuff, adjusted Corsi. Um, but I'm going to say, once again, even shot plus minus is, is biased and for two reasons. Um, your teammates and the, and the quality of your position, you can cater for that. But you can't cater for a style of play. Um, some defensemen like to pinch at the line. And that's going to cause them to get a lot of shots for. But the shots that go against them are going to be really high scoring chances. If you're just looking at Corsi stats, um, you, you're missing sometimes, on some players, what's really happening in the game. Um, the regression models and sort of uh, what I'm going to call frequentist models, there's, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, Thor was one of the, the big sort of starters for this. It sort of uses every single piece of, um, every single action that happens in every single game, it fits a big regression model and tells you how good players are. These, these models are really great, but the problems are um, every time you have a game that you want to include in the model, you have to run a giant regression that takes a long time. Um, so it's quite slow to update. You have the trouble of overfitting, um, but we, you can fix that by regularizing your regression or whatever method you're using. But what you're missing out on is information on your prior data. Now, what this comes down to is the classic debate between frequentists and Bayesian people. <laughs> um, I don't want to get into it, but by using a frequentist approach, you're missing out on knowledge that you have about the game going into it. You know that no goalie could possibly sustain a 98% save percentage, and you can include that information in your models as data. So I started thinking about this, and I wanted to create a metric with the advantages that I wanted. So I wanted two-way play. I wanted to be able to utilize as much data as I could possibly use, every single shift in the NHL since 2002. I don't want any bias. I don't want it to be slow to update. I want updating in like that for a single game. No overfeeding, and I want to take advantage of prior information. And like a chess piece kicking me in the face, it hit me. The answer was ELO. Now, ELO, ELO was originally developed in the 30s to rate chess players. A guy by the name of Arpad ELO invented it, so it doesn't stand for anything like most people ask me. And the basic premise is that when two players play against each other, one has a rating and the other has a different rating, and the difference is going to be an expectation for what will happen in the game. When you exceed the expectation, quite simply, your rating goes up. When you fall short of the expectation, your rating goes down. Eventually, your rating will be at the correct spot, and you'll continue to meet the expectations. If you didn't, your ratings would change. Um, 
lots of sports have been using this simple system to evaluate teams. In particular, the BCS system in college football, where there's hundreds of teams and they only play 10 games each, had to be used to determine which team was better given that they didn't all play each other. Um, the, ra the rating system has been improved mo most notably by Mark Gleekman, who included an official uncertainty parameter for each player, um, thereby increasing the Bayesian nature of this method. And uh, we have a member of Microsoft here, actually. Um, Microsoft developed a technology called TrueSkill, which they use to evaluate um, Xbox gamers in multiplayer games and even multi-team games. And they do this in a fully Bayesian sense, and it's very close to imagining a hockey game where you have shifts of different players on the ice constantly changing. Each shift can be v viewed as a miniature game. You can win it by scoring, you can lose it by being scored on, or you can just draw. Even if you draw, the ratings might change a little bit. So basically, that's what I've done for the NHL. Oops. So I'm going to start with the, the end of the talk, basically. You know what? I'm kind of leaning over. Can I get that mic? Oh, great. Great. So uh, what we're seeing here is the top 10 players in the NHL based on two-way play, how much you outscore your opponent. And these, these numbers don't don't know who has scored the goals. So even though Sidney Crosby has been scoring at a prolific rate, this algorithm has no idea that he was the one that scored the goals. It's only goals that were scored while he was on the ice or goals scored against while he was on the ice. So these are the top 10 right now. And this number is, is just a number. I'll explain what it means later. 1.82 is high. 1.74 is also very high because this here is the distribution of the entire league. So 1.5 is, is the starting um, ELO value for every player. 1.8 is a super elite player. In the course of his career, Crosby's best ever rating was at 1.92. Uh, that was right before he got injured. Um, Ryan Getzlaff has also been up there with an incredible rating, as has Pavel Datsuk. Um, an interesting guy here is Tyler Toffoli, who I think is very underrated. Um, and Mark Stone is up there, but the, the rest of these guys should be absolutely no surprise for their two-way prowess. Um, in terms of the nuts and bolts of the algorithm, what I was saying about a Bayesian updating system, I'll explain here. Every player in the league has to start at a particular rating, and we just have to tell, it, tell the algorithm what that rating is. So we're going to say it's 1.5, but it's more than that. It's 1.5 with a very flat distribution, so lots of uncertainty. As you play the game, the algorithm might realize that you're good. So as it increases your rating, it'll decrease your uncertainty. With smaller uncertainty, it's harder to change your rating, but your rating can still change over time. Um, like I said, we go shift by shift, and whenever you exceed expectations, your ratings will increase. If you fall short, they'll decrease. Um, the, one of the classic things that I do for this algorithm is because there's a lot of tunable parameters, I can actually pick them at will. And what I've done is I've picked the parameters to make the power play totally um, in sync with 5-on-5 five five hockey, which means this is a measure of two-way play, but it encapsulates both the power play and shorthanded situations in a seamless fashion. So let's take an example to explain it. Imagine Team Canada is playing Team Switzerland in the Olympics. Team Canada's average ELO is about 1.7. They're occupying this very elite part of the NHL today. Team Switzerland are drawing from rookies and the occasional good player, but their average ELO is more likely to be about 1.5. When you run the numbers, the expected goal difference in this game is going to be 4.5 goals to Canada. The outcome happened to be that Canada got three goals and Switzerland scored one, but McDavid and Getzlaff had excellent statistical games. The result on that is that most of the Canadian players, despite the win, will see a decrease in their ratings. Why? 
they were supposed to outscore these guys by four and a half goals, and they didn't. So for most of the time while they were on the ice, they were not living to their expectations. So a small decrease in ratings would occur. Getzlaff, on the other hand, had a great game. And his rating will increase a little because he did exceed his expectations a little bit. McDavid, let's say he had a similar game to Getzlaff. McDavid's rating, because he's a rookie, is still only about 1.6. So because of that, his expectation was a little bit lower. And his rating is going to climb a lot faster from this game as a result of his strong play. Furthermore, because of McDavid's a rookie, he has high uncertainty. High uncertainty means you're... High uncertainty means your rating can change much quicker. Let's take a look at the careers of some famous players, um, good ones. Crosby, uh, he was number one on our list, and he quickly started his uh, career at 1.5, as everyone does, but he quickly shut up and showed his talent for two-way play, peaked in uh, 2013, no, 12, 13. And he's still playing really high hockey. This green graph is one of the best defensemen of our time, uh, Nicholas Lidstrom. Very solid play. He wasn't a rookie when we started collecting the data. That was just when uh, full shift data became available in the NHL. And another player of note that I, this is a guy I really like, and LA might not be able to afford to keep him later on, so keep an eye on him, is Tyler Toffoli. Um, this guy looks like he's really filling the shoes of uh, Kopitar over there, and, and he's just going to be a really solid hockey player in the years to come. Um, I th thought it would be interesting to put McDavid and Eichel up here just to see their rookie seasons. Um, both of them have reached the 1.6 mark already, which is indicative of uh, definite top line. Um, oops. They're definitely top-line talent. Um, McDavid was injured, otherwise he'd probably be higher than Eichel by now. So it's not just three minutes. Okay, it's not just goals, but um, you can apply the exact same method for shots. Um, it, it, the information it gives you is going to be a little bit biased to how teams play, but it's still very interesting to look at a player's shooting versus their. Um, goals. So Elo is for goals, and Corsi Elo is shooting. And we're looking at PK Subban's career. And what we see here as a rookie is this guy, he's very offensively gifted. He's creating a lot of shots for his team, but his team are only scoring marginally. And his, you know, a lot of people were uh, saying he was not playing defensively enough. So what you can diagnose whenever you see this in a defenseman's chart is that they're probably being overly careless on the forecheck trying to, get, trying to go for a goal when they should be uh, playing a little more cautiously. So in Subban's career, he actually played a little more cautiously on the forecheck, and we saw a huge uptick in his uh, two-way production. Just to, to outline how uh, the lines in the NHL compare in, in terms of time on ice versus ELO, we're looking at the average top line in the NHL of, for forwards, top three forwards has an average ELO of 1.6, second line 1.56, etc. Fourth line is basically rookie level. Then for defensemen, um, we're not seeing the, the high numbers as we do for offensemen, which I thought was really interesting um, because I, I checked whether this was some kind of error in the method by comparing it to five on five results, and you see the same thing in five on five. So there is something there. Is it, is it that forwards are better, and when you're a kid, if, if you're good, you play forward? Is it um, that offense is easier to scout, so there could be some really good defensemen out there that never made the NHL? Uh, there, there's lots of really interesting explanations for this, that perhaps uh, defensemen don't get a chance to really affect the, the game in two ways. They really only play defense. But yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, and just incidentally, the best defenseman I have in the NHL is uh, Ekman Larsson. Um, I don't know, you, you guys probably have your own stats and it'd be interesting to see what you think of that. Uh, and Brian, Brian Campbell from Florida is also really highly ranked. 
Um, this is my prediction for the cup. We're looking at the number of points scored in the regular season versus team averaged ELO for the whole season. <laughs> Surprisingly, to me at least, that uh, New York is the top ELO team. So according to this, I have New York beating St. Louis in the final. However, I looked into more detail on like form, and uh, I also removed goalies from the equation because rating goalies with ELO, I could talk about that at length. Um, it's, it's not as good as rating skaters. And because of New York's obvious dependence on Lundqvist, I have redone my picks to say it'll be some either Pittsburgh or St. Louis. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>